So I'm Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at the New School, and I'm very pleased you could all make it this morning. Um, this is a great crowd, considering the heat, but it's a good thing we did it in the morning and not the evening. Um, the Center for New York City Affairs is a think tank within the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. And we focus primarily on issues of child and family poverty and public education in New York City. We do ap applied policy research, as well as laboratory work with students and a lot of other interesting things. So check out our website at centernyc.org if you haven't. Three years ago, we became the research partner on a project funded by the Deutsche Bank American Founda America's Foundation called the College Ready Communities Initiative. And the project supports four very different collaboratives that link nonprofit community development corporations and advocacy organizations with public high schools and middle schools in, in various neighborhoods around the city. And the collaboratives set out to improve college readiness and guidance and college knowledge among students and teachers and um, also their families in these schools. And they've been working at campuses, at high school campuses in Bushwick and Cypress Hills. They've been in schools uh, for recent immigrants in Soundview and Elmhurst and Flushing. And they've been in the large Flushing High School, as well as in a couple of middle schools in Harlem. So they're working with students as early as sixth and seventh grade there. Um, over time, some have become rock solid parts of those schools, in others, not so much, but it's fascinating to see the, the different strategies and the different ways they've been doing this work. Um, what we've seen across the board in these schools, and in fact, in many schools across the city, for different reasons, is a steadily rising number of students applying to college, and in fact, attending college over the last few years. And we've seen that nonprofit organizations, whatever their strategy, are trying to fill very large gaps in many of the schools, bringing staff and leadership and new resources to the students. One of the, in fact, one of the most substantial, substantial things we've seen in the College Ready Communities Initiative is the amount of resources that the community groups are bringing into the schools. In all of these schools, the students are mostly from low-income families. Just one-fifth have parents who finished college and just 30% have parents who ever attended any amount of college. So their families don't have a lot of higher education experience to fall back on when it comes to guiding their children. And in that sense, these schools are a lot like the rest of the city. So our session today and the report that we'll be publishing in a few weeks are meant to spark a discussion about what we've learned. You've got parts of that report in your packet, but not the whole thing. We're looking to today's panel and to all of you to give us feedback and ideas in response to what we talk about today and in response to what you've got in your hand as we move towards publishing our findings and recommendations next month. So in your packets, you have a photocopy of some excerpts from the forthcoming report, including a number of charts. And I'm going to quickly go through a few of those charts right now to help set up the discussion. And then I'll introduce Professor Conley, who, who's going to talk about his own influential work around college readiness. Um, I don't know how well you can read that, but you have it in your packet. Um, in a student survey we did last year, in fact, we've done a whole series of student surveys as part of this project. We asked 468 10th graders in seven city high schools to tell us about their career aspirations. And I found the answers kind of amazing um, and pretty revealing. This, the New York students clearly don't think that it's uncool to succeed. Nearly a third of them in, hope to be or intend to be professionals, such as doctors or lawyers. Many more hope to be in business or the arts or teaching or technology. And this was not a particularly selective survey. This was entire classes of students. Um, these are students from some of the city's toughest schools, and these kids have very high expectations. And they're attempting to follow through on them by graduating high school and going on to college. But in our surveys, we also found that about half of these kids, these are 10th graders, they had no idea that they were not on track to be ready for college. They didn't know that their grades in ninth and 10th grade count on their college applications. Many of them didn't understand the consequences of missing weeks or months of school every year. And they told us that getting a high school diploma will show the world that they're ready for college. So alongside that paradox, we see another one. 
Today, many, many more New York City students are graduating from high school than ten, compared to 10 years ago. And many more are indeed going to college. Everyone has to be proud of that. This is a sea change in New York City. The number of city public high school graduates enrolling in CUNY surged to 25,600 in 2009 from 16,200 in 2002. It's a jump of 57%. CUNY's been breaking records every year. There's a total of 272,000 student, students enrolled in CUNY as of last year. At the same time, there's a chasm between the hope and the reality. At the CUNY community colleges, for example, which is the, the um, darker blue tier, most of those who enroll never earn a degree. What you don't see on this chart, but you will in another one in the packet, uh, is that the three-year graduation rate for first-time, full-time freshmen at CUNY community colleges was only 12% last year. So there's all kinds of reasons why high school graduates find themselves not ready for college. For many, the greatest challenge is academic. Their high school education has simply not prepared them for the demands of college. This slide shows the city's high school graduating classes of 2005 through 2010. And these are data from the Department of Ed, and there's a caveat that I'll give you in a minute. The, depart the, the number of students graduating high school on time is going up steadily. That top line below the dark blue shows, young, uh, shows the steady increase in the city's graduation rate. The dark blue at the top represents young people who are either dropping out of high school or not finishing in four years. And that has shrunk a great deal in that period. The middle tier represents students graduating on time, but who may need remediation because their region scores were too low for them to qualify immediately for CUNY credit bearing courses. And the bottom tier is the one fifth of students that scored high enough on their regions to qualify outright as college ready. I got to note that that label in the white piece where it says um, students ready for college by CUNY standards. Um, it's misleading and we'll be changing it in the report. In fact, it's a state measure, not the CUNY standard, but the city's standard, which brings that last number up to about 25%, shows uh, that the most recent, that 25% of the most recent cohort graduated, quote, college ready. Part of that reason is there, there, there are clearly other ways to avoid remediation, but I won't go into the details here. We can talk about that on the panel. Nonetheless, the majority of students going into CUNY um, are not fully ready by either standard. Here's a look at how one cohort of city high school students progressed. This chart didn't print properly in your packet, but you can see it correctly here. For every 100 students who started high school in 2006, 11 dropped out, 15 took more than four years to graduate, and 71 graduated on time. And of these, 51 enrolled in college in the fall of 2010. And it's important to note that this doesn't include uh, students in the special needs schools in districts 75 and 79, and it doesn't include charter schools. These are students in general ed high schools. So the academic hurdle is only one of many challenges that sidelines students from college. There's family issues, there's money problems, and for some, there's just a lack of knowledge about what it really takes to do well in college and complete a degree. The Department of Education has begun shifting its agenda from, from graduation as the goal, um, lifting more students over that bar, to something much more complicated, pressing high schools to prepare all students for college or career or both, and aligning high school graduation with college readiness, which is of huge importance. And that's really what we're here to talk about. Another part of the solution has to address issues beyond academic performance. College access, for example, includes college guidance, helping students with information and support for picking a school, filling out their applications, dealing with financial aid. Um, in our report and in one of the articles in your packet, we go into depth about the problems with guidance and with um, FAFSA in the city's high schools. Um, today, guidance counselor caseloads are, are very large. The columns on this chart show that more than half, so, so what you see here is the, the number of schools with that caseload across the bottom. So nine schools have a caseload of one to 100 students per guidance counselor. The majority, um, the half of the, actually half, more than half of the city's high schools have guidance caseloads of between 100 and 300 students per counselor in 2011. Another 151 had even higher caseloads or no counselor at all. And keep in mind, just, just a fraction 
generally one-fifth of a counselor's time is spent on college guidance. So as a result, many young people, as we found at least in the college-ready community schools, many young people get very little college guidance support, and those who do usually begin the work only in 11th grade, unless there are other interventions brought in. This is where nonprofit organizations often step in to try to fill the gaps. And there's scores of organizations all over the city doing this kind of work in the high schools, alongside youth development programs and leadership programs and so on. Um, this is these two slides, which you can't really read from a distance, but again, these are in your packet. Um, you'll see in the final report and in what you've got there that we describe the work of many of these organizations, not only those in the initiative that, we're, that I was talking about a minute ago, but several others. As this table shows, the gaps that nonprofits and parents and communities try to fill are large ones. The white represents the work done primarily by families and nonprofit groups or volunteers, and the blue represents what, what the schools aspire to accomplish. Um, the point being that there's a whole lot of stuff that other people have to step in and do. But those gaps are too large for nonprofits to fill, frankly. We, we also talk in the report about the moral dilemma that worries so many people in this field. Everyone knows that young people will be better off economically if they get a college degree. But are we getting more and more young people into college who aren't truly prepared to succeed there? Um, we heard that from almost every interview we did in, in the nonprofit sector. Are we setting young people up to fail and helping them take on mountains of debt? We don't think it really has to work out that way. Um, and I think a lot of you probably agree, there are things to be done. What we hope will come of our work is a greater awareness across the sector of the lessons learned on the ground in schools and in um, the neighborhood organizations and some of the good ideas that will help more students live up to their expectations and their aspirations. So as I said, we're eager for your feedback. We're eager for a rich discussion. Please recognize that the chapters included in your packet represent only about half of the final report, and you may well find proofing errors and, and other flaws, but we thought it was important to share this and move, as we move on to the next phase, which is having a, a wider discussion about um, what needs to happen in the sector. I want to thank Kim Nauer for her tireless work on this effort, particularly over the last crazy couple of weeks. Um, and I want to thank our funders, including Sam Marks and Nicole Leach of the Deutsche Bank Americas Foundation, Jen Stredler at the Capital One Foundation, the United Way of New York City, the Cyrus Fund, and the Milano Foundation. And I'd also like to thank the Department of Ed, Department of Education, for its very constructive cooperation with data and for offering their insights. And I want to thank the nonprofit organizations and the students uh, and the teachers and the participants in the College Ready Communities Initiative for giving us access and sharing their experience. So we're very lucky today to have Professor David Conley here with us. David is CEO of the Educational Policy Improvement Center and Professor of Educational Leadership at the University of Oregon. And I should note that two of his books, College Knowledge and College and Career Ready, have not only shaped the national debate on this issue, they've also given us a powerful frame for our own work here at the New School. David. Thank you. Um, I'm still running on West Coast time, so this makes it about 6 a.m. for me. So this is an early speech, but i um, more than happy to, to be here and share with you. It's also going to be relatively quick. Uh, it's about 20 minutes. I'm going to be talking to you. So if, you want to, if I go a little bit quickly through some of this material, we will post this on our website, which is epiconline.org, and you'll be able to take a look at it there. <clears throat> um, my intention here is really just to kind of hit some of the high points about thinking about college and career readiness to set a frame and a context for the, dis the discussion that's going to follow after. So just some of the, sort of the higher level observations that I have for you here is that we want, we're, we're in an era where we're now focused on having all students ready to keep learning beyond high school. So let's not get hung up on the term college and career ready as much as the notion that students are supposed to keep learning beyond high school. What that really says is that the high school diploma is not the end of the process, which many students think it is. Don't they? I mean, have any of you gone to graduations lately or, or you're getting ready to go to some graduations? And it's a magical time, isn't it, watching those students get up and walk across that stage? Unfortunately, sometimes it's a little bit like, um, do, you, do you remember the, um, was it the, the, the um, scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz? 
when all of it, say he's given the, his diploma and all of a sudden he recites, you know, ironically the Pythagorean theorem, the idea that that makes him an educated person. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, the, it, it's this notion that the conf conveying of the diploma is a transformational act. Well, I mean, I worked in public schools for 20 years and I worked at the high school level for a long time. And that was, a, it was those graduation days were days to be cherished. The families were so happy, so excited. What I want to make sure, and I think what we all want to make sure, is that it's not a false promise, that it really leads to something. So when we think about the purpose of a high school education, it should be, and of, of, of the entire educational process, it should be to be able to keep learning beyond high school in some formal context. That's a 21st century skill, if there ever was one. You need to be able to keep learning, not just on your own, um, but in a context in which you will get some recognition for that, you'll get a certificate, you'll get a degree, uh, you'll get um, perhaps a competency rating, you'll get some recognition of that learning because we are becoming a certificate driven society. 30 years, 50 years ago you could make it on your own without any, without a certificate, without that formal acknowledgement of your knowledge, but now almost all areas are, have some sort of, a, of an access point that requires you to go through some sort of a certification process. Even uh, many of the trades, many of the uh, service industries uh, and as you move up into the higher skill requirement jobs, there's almost always some form of certification. So keep that in mind. The goal here is let's get kids ready to keep learning beyond high school, not just to fulfill a set of requirements to receive that, that, um, that diploma, that recognition of 12 years of, you know, as Woody Allen said, 80% of life is showing up, while 80% of high school sometimes can be showing up if we're not careful. We want to make sure there's a content, that there's an engagement, that there's a real um, development that occurs as a result of that. All right, so right now we're using the term college and career ready, but in many cases we're not very clear on what it means. <clears throat> um, for many people it means a grade point average, or it means um, a set of courses you took, um, or it might be some other uh, indication. It could be an admissions test score. ACT has a series of scores off their test. So we have multiple definitions, multiple means, but at the heart of it um, is also the notion do we have college ready and career ready being the same <clears throat> or different? And in our work, what we've, what we've determined is that college readiness and career readiness overlap in significant ways, but they're not exactly the same. So that adds a little complexity to the conversation, and we've got to keep that in mind because our students are going to complex futures. They're going to a wide variety. And I don't know if you noticed on the chart, but 7% of New York City high school students are going to be professional athletes. So <clears throat> that's, we're going to have to expand the NBA to about 8,000 players. But, um, <laughs> So we've got, we've got, you know, career readiness is not a well-established notion in a lot of kids' minds. So I think we're going to have to really work on understanding that career readiness is a set of skills that overlaps college readiness but is not exactly the same. And I'll try to come back and talk about that more specifically in a moment. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'll give you a definition of readiness in a moment. But I'd like, for, for the time being at least, for you to think about readiness being the alignment among a student's skills, interests, aspirations, and post-secondary objectives, not a test score. <clears throat> alone. And I understand that we need to use test scores and we need to you know, acknowledge the fact um, that reading and writing scores and math scores are important and I'll, I want to try to put those into a context. But what we want to do in, an, in a model where we want more students to succeed, <clears throat> we've got to make sure that we're coming up with more definitions of success. So a cut score model in essence limits our definition when in fact a student may not need exactly the same knowledge or skill in all areas in order to succeed. And I'll come back to that theme in a moment. But let's think about readiness relative to their, their skills, interests, aspirations, and objectives. So if we, go, if we go in that direction, then we think of readiness as being something that occurs across multiple dimensions. And I'm going to give you those dimensions in a moment and not being unidimensional. Uh, right now, the measurement system we have in place is simply not going to be entirely sufficient to determine all of this information. We're going to need to have more measures than we have currently, and I'll give you some examples of that as well. So college and career readiness, then, as I noted before, is more than a score on a single test. So to be clear, I'm not anti-testing. I'm not anti-English and math scores. I'm saying they are necessary. They're not entirely sufficient. And, I, and I'll give you some examples of some things that are obvious that I think you'll agree with that would supplement and support the scores on a math and an English test, but that right now we're not measuring and including anywhere near as well as we could. Well, I think the, the figures that we saw a moment ago help us to understand that we do have an aspirations gap. If you look at a third of those students saying they want to be in the professions and then not doing the things it takes to do that. When I worked in high schools, I ran into this all the time. Young people who had very high aspirations 
and not the behaviors to match with it. On the, so in, in one sense, we have succeeded in getting young people to know that they ought to aspire to go on to post-secondary education. Where we haven't succeeded is getting them to match those behaviors to the aspirations, which is going to create tremendous frustration for uh, many of these young people. And it's also going to lead to a lot of wasted talent in our society. So we want to break that cycle, and we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. So uh, uh, we saw a chart a moment ago with, um, it showed the rate of students going on in uh, New York schools. This is the same chart except for at the national level. And you start with 93% of students say that they, uh, they want to go to college. Now that's an incredibly high number. And it's the same, that number is comparable in urban, rural, suburban settings. So we've done a great job getting the aspirations across. Those numbers continue to drop. You can see at the different levels here, going from that to the number who graduate from high school, the number who enroll in college, and then the number who graduate from college. Or those are the three different levels that you have there. So that you end up with um, about 26% of students from that initial cohort of 100, eventually six years after they graduate from high school, getting a degree, at least getting a bachelor's degree. That's a tremendous drop off. But it's not to say everyone needs a bachelor's degree, but it is to say we've got this mismatch between maybe two thirds of the students saying that they're going to be involved in some sort of post-secondary education, and then clearly far fewer than that being able to do so. So let's think about readiness a little more broadly then. And let's see how this helps us to consider what the various futures are for our young people. Well, right now, if we think about what it takes to go out and get a job at the entry level, and we ask employers, what does it take, what do you want to expect from entry level workers at the very lowest level, what we get is actually a depressingly low level of expectation. Have you seen some of those employer surveys? I'd like an employee who could, number one, show up. Number two, I'd like it if they weren't on drugs or uh, alcohol. And number three, it'd be great if they didn't get in fights with their fellow you know, employees. So that's like a low level of expectation. But in that, and what's really depressing is that many young people don't meet that level. So work ready is, has, is about character. It's about behavior. It's about um, personal uh, habits. It's about accepting responsibility for your, for your behaviors and so forth. There's a set of, of values there and ethics and norms uh, norm, normative behavior that we have to cultivate in schools and in students. Well, let's say then we get everyone work ready. The next trick is to get them job ready. And in my definition, job ready means that you're prepared to engage in a training program of some sort that an employer offers. Now, that could be as simple as being shown how the job is done, but it could be as complex as having to engage in some sort of a formal process to learn that, profession, that particular job itself. Not a profession, not a career pathway, but a, an actual job. And once again, many young people fall down here. And what sort of problems do they have? Speaking and listening. More with the emphasis on listening. A lot of young people, when they are being taught a job and being trained for a job, I'm not talking about a formal educational training program. I'm talking about being shown what to do. Don't do a good job following directions. Something as simple as that becomes a limiting factor for many of our young people. And yet, and I'll come back to this, we're not really measuring that or developing that systematically. Speaking is another very important skill that in the workplace for many entry-level jobs is very important. Communicating with your coworkers or communicating in the retail sector with a client or a customer. Well, let's say that you've got the, then all of our students work ready and job ready. What's the next expectation? Well, uh, what I call pathway ready, which is the ability to move through a career pathway. This is the first point at which we really are talking about learning formally beyond high school. So um, if, you, if you want to go into the medical field, it may not be that you're going to get into medical school, but it's entirely possible you could start off as a medical technician and, and then take additional courses and you might become a paramedic, you might become a physician assistant, you might become a physician, you might go into hospital records administration, um, you might go into emergency medicine policy. There's, it's basically, it's a career path the way that can go any of a number of directions. It's not linear. But you need a set of learning skills. And what we've found is that while the content knowledge is important, there's another set of skills that we call uh, key learning skills and techniques, which is how you learn. It's managing the learning process itself. And many of you in the room are good at this. You know how to study. You know how to manage your time. You know how to set goals for yourselves. You know how to persist if you're given a little bit of a difficult situation. It's why you've gotten to where you are. Think about the young people who don't know how to learn. They'll have a very difficult time in this pathway, even if they manage to get a score on one of those tests that says they're prepared. They don't have that set of that 
repertoire of strategies to keep them going in new and unfamiliar situations. And particularly when you go from high school to college, what you can see is a difference in philosophy about ownership of learning, right? That in college you're expected to own your learning. Post-secondary readiness then is this ability to go above a remedial level on an entry level course uh, and on the placement tests that accompany um, admission. Now it's a fairly arbitrary definition, but, it's a, but if we think about it, the distinction between a career path and a post-secondary path in a, for a bachelor's degree is that post-secondary education has general education requirements. The career path can be much more specific. <clears throat> if you're going to be a medical records technician, you will not likely take literature. I mean, I'm not saying that's a good thing, I'm just saying that's the way it is. If you're going for a bachelor's degree, you're almost always expected to engage in a broad set of courses. So the bachelor's has with it a wider set of expectations, and sometimes that's the measure we use for all students. When in fact, if we want more students to succeed, we've got to make sure they're th strengthening the areas where they'll be expected to be competent, when they can compensate somewhat for weaknesses in other areas. And then finally, we don't want to ignore the fact that all of this is the purpose of which it is to make students ready for career and life, that they can continue to apply this learning beyond schooling in a positive and productive fashion. Well, that's a lot of complexity there, so let me throw in just a little bit more. Um, <laughs> let's. I organize this, what I just described to you, I organize into a four-part model. And I say, students need to be capable and competent in these four areas if they're going to be ready for college and career both, or either. The first thing is they need to know how to think. They need to have cognitive strategies. And most of our young people are not good at this. Most of their teaching and learning involves what we call declarative and procedural knowledge. Declarative is basically factual information. Procedural is basically applying that factual information in a variety of defined contexts. What they lack is conditional and conceptual knowledge and skills. Conditional is the how, what, how, what, where, when, and why of using knowledge. And the conceptual is understanding the structure of knowledge, that larger frame. So the second piece then is the content knowledge itself. And what we find is you don't need to know every detail. It's that you need to understand something about the structure of knowledge within a subject area because guess what? In college, you're basically retaught almost all of the actual content. So not knowing every bit of content won't kill you if you understand something about the structure of knowledge in a subject area. The third of the keys then is uh, the key learning skills and techniques, which is um, I mentioned before, which is how you go about learning. And this is something where we just don't teach people very much of this formally. And so what we get is this, you talk about an achievement gap, we've got a learning skills gap. Because we have students who know how to learn, we have students who don't know how to learn. And we think that we're dealing with differences in cognitive capability, when in fact, we're simply dealing with differences in, strat in, in strategies, in <laughs> techniques. And these are all teachable, they're malleable. And the fourth area are these transition knowledge and skills. And, and we mentioned things like the FAFSA and other structural barriers we put in the way of people progressing through our system. Well, the US may not be number one on um, international comparisons of math and, uh, and science scores, but when it comes to the complexity of making the transition from high school to college, boy, we're number one. So um, not sure that's anything to be really proud of, but uh, think about the fact that we've created this knowledge intensive set of requirements that almost every one of us use only once in our lives. You know? Now, if we've got children, the way it works is you mess this up with the first one, and then you figure it out. Hopefully, you've had that second and third one, because then you can really use that knowledge productively. So uh, we, we have this system that is so knowledge intensive that you have to use social networks. You have to, use social cap you have, to have social capital to make it work. That's why first generation students are at such a disadvantage. Now, the long term answer is simplify the system. Other countries make it much simpler, and we could talk about that another time. But for now, we're left with having to transmit that knowledge much more effectively than we do. So to make this simpler, I, I turned it into four action verbs. Students need to think, know, act, go. That's a message we think we can convey to students. Tell them you need to think. You've got to use your brain. You've got to process information. You can't just get the work done fast. You've got to know what you're doing. The know part is understand the content you're learning. Don't just get through it, give it out on a test, and forget it. The act part is take control of your learning, own your learning, and develop the skills that you need to be effective at it. Go, prepare yourself for going to college. Think, know, act, go. This is a poster I'd like to get up in every you know, high school classroom in America is have kids look at this and, 
be, and realize that there's a complexity to this, but it's all under their control. It's malleable. They can get good at this. They don't have to quote, unquote, be smart. They have to be active. They have to be engaged. They have to persist. They have to care. So I'm going to skip over some of these in the interest of, of efficiency, but uh, this is an example of the cognitive strategy model we use that uh, shows you the kinds of things we mean when we say students need to think. They need to be able to formulate a problem as opposed to complete a task. They need to be able to collect information. Research is an incredibly important skill for the 21st century. They need to be able to interpret the information they have, which it requires slowing down and thinking, not just starting to write the answer or the paper before you understand even what you've collected. And then when they communicate, they need to think about their audience and the formats and the structure of what they're doing. And they need to do all this with precision and accuracy, not a natural tendency for a lot of our young people. Well, this would be an example of a cognitive task that uses cognitive strategies. And you can see it's taking a natural disaster and then predicting reasons that humans are affected by natural disasters. That's that problem formulation part. Then researching a type of natural disaster, outlining how to mitigate the impact. That's that interpretation part. And um, then discussing the trade-offs associated with it. That's that uh, communication part. So this is an example of something that gets you to engage in that cognitive development, that cognitive engagement. So the content knowledge piece, we need more than facts and terms. We need linking ideas, organizing concepts. But also in the lower right-hand corner, we need to look at how students engage with knowledge. Do they explain their success based on aptitude or effort? If it's aptitude, they say, I'm good at this or I'm not good at it. Aptitude-based explanations mean you don't engage any further, because what's the point? Effort-based attribution says, if I try harder, it makes a difference. So the orientation of content knowledge is just as important as the actual knowledge itself that you're, that you're learning. Um, these learning uh, skills, are, here's some examples of those. I've, I've touched on a lot of these, you know, self-awareness, goal setting. Goal setting is incredibly important. It's cheap. We don't need a ton of PD. We can do this sort of thing. Students can set short-term, medium-term, longer-term goals. What can I do different class tomorrow? What do I do by the end of the next unit? What do I do at the end of the class? What do I want to do by the end of high school? We can have these in place, track them, have students get constant feedback. You know, most learning requires pretty much constant feedback. I don't know if you have any tennis players, you know, but if you're playing tennis, every time you hit the ball, you try to monitor and adjust what you do, right? I mean, you don't wait till the end of your game and then say, well, I did the following five things wrong. Now, the next game, I'll do that. I mean, there's, a, there's another level of analysis that, that says cumulatively, what did I do over the whole game? But you're monitoring and adjusting constantly throughout your performance. And yet, our, much of what we do with testing implies that we wait until you've made a series of mistakes over a long period of time, and then we tell you what you got wrong. The mo learning is a process of constantly monitoring and adjusting. So goal setting helps you to do that. You're f these kinds of things you're familiar with, you look at that, think about yourselves, think about your children. These are the things that make people successful, not just being brilliant. These are some of the others. Being able to manage your time and take notes, study for tests, memorize. See, this is not about you know, not engaging with factual information. That's an incredibly important part of this. This is not an either-or proposition. It's a both-and. There's ways that you, there's things you just have to learn that aren't fun and aren't interesting, and the research says that some students are, accept that, that you can just, you have to learn some things. But there's another level that says you have to engage cognitively to make that happen. And then the transition knowledge and skills, you can see the complexity by looking at this. All right. So the point that I've made is that college readiness is a continuum. If we think about this student and say, how ready is this student? And you look, the KCS is the cognitive strategies and the content knowledge and the learning techniques and strategies and then the uh, transitional knowledge and skills. And here's a student who he said, well, look, around their cognitive strategies, they get up to about career ready. Their content knowledge, they're actually pretty strong. But their learning skills and techniques, they're reasonably strong. But their transition knowledge and skills, not so strong. So we'd have, uh, this student is going to have some trouble because of that, that lack of transition knowledge and skills, even though they've got the content. So if we knew this about the student, we'd know they're going to need some help on that transition. They might not have the maturity to make the transition, right? So the second student now, if we look at this person, they've got the cognitive strategies. They're not so good on the content knowledge, but they're strong on the learning techniques and on the transition strategies. This might be more what an adult learner looks like. Someone who's got a lot of life skills, but they're just not that strong on the content knowledge. Now, if we just give them a placement test, we're going to say, well, you just need to learn more math you know, or more English. That may not be really all that they need to do. They may be ready in some other areas, but we don't know that because we didn't capture that information. So um, what would be in a profile? You notice that I've got a couple cognitive tests. That's fine. I've got a knowledge test. But look what I've added, speaking, listening, research. And we can collect that information. It's not that difficult to do. 
methodologically speaking. How about technological proficiency? Totally overlooking that. We're thinking that anybody who can thumb type is technologically proficient. That's just not true. Um, and then I've added three kind of character, character elements, persistence, effort, and global and goal focus. And you notice that I've said some things are going to be high stakes and some are going to be low stakes. So I, I said we don't have to weight everything the same. We can take that profile and we can then say, we'll standardize the scores. We'll see, we'll see what it looks like against. We can still use a cut level. And now we can say we could, that we have some sense of where you're likely to do well and where you're likely to have problems. Doesn't mean we have to use all the information to it for admissions, but it tells us something about you, but more importantly, for our students, it tells them something about themselves. They get a better picture of where they're going to be strong and weak and what they need to do to be successful. We need to equip them. We need to empower them. We need to enable them to go on with more information than that, that important score about math and English, but more information that they can act upon. So that's the heart of it. So the challenge then is, given the complexity of all of this, is rather than thinking about an assessment system, we should think about a system of assessments. What's the combination of measures that we could use? And in this case, I've just could have rattled off a few. Uh, student self-reports are entirely valid if the primary purpose is to inform the student themselves, rather than to make a high-stakes decision. Um, we can use curricular, uh, curricular embedded performance tasks in a variety of ways if we don't overweight them or if we triangulate them against other results. Everything doesn't have to meet the same criterion of a high stakes standardized test for it to be valuable and useful. So the results then would yield a profile of readiness in relationship to goals. You see it's not generic readiness, it's relationship to what you say you want to do. That requires us to know more about what it really takes to succeed in different post-secondary endeavors. And that's work that we're doing in our center. Uh, and I've, if you've heard of badge systems, that's sort of one way to think about this. So, with that, uh, that's kind of a brief overview. I know that we want to get to the panel discussion, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Illuminating, right? <laughs> um, I don't know about you, but I find this stuff fascinating. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce our moderator for this discussion. Meredith Kalodner is a reporter and editor for our Inside Schools project. Um, if you don't know it, please look at insideschools.org after you leave today. Um, she previously covered New York City's public schools for the Daily News and uh, the chief leader years ago, and she's also written for the Times and the Prospect and many other places. Meredith, come on up. Hi, good morning. So can we get the rest of the panelists to come on up? We have, um, you have everyone's bio sheets in front of you in your packet, but um, just to go through it, David Conley is here. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Educational Policy Improvement Center um, and many other things. And then Shale Polidosaransky is the um, Deputy Chancellor, Chief Academic Officer and Senior Deputy Chancellor at the City Education Department. Then next to him we have Sheena Wright, who's the President and CEO of Abyssinian Development Corporation. Um, Richard Alvarez is the Director of Admissions at CUNY. And Fernando Carlo is uh, the Director of Sisters and Brothers at the Northwest Bronx Community Clergy Coalition. So welcome, thanks so much for coming early. Step into the mic, okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions, but first I want to ask the audience, just so we know who's here, um, how many of you guys are parents of public school students? Okay. And how many of you guys are in the policy nonprofit analysis world? Okay, great. And how many are students? No. And educators? <coughs> Awesome, and I, are there any other types of people in the world? I don't know, I think we're, <laughs> do we cover everyone there? Okay, there's one person extra in the back, okay. So, um, to begin with, I think one of the things we're looking at is, what is the role of high schools? What is it that we're asking high schools to do? Um, it's clearly changed a lot over the years, and so I wanna start with Shale to just ask, you know, 
there's obviously been great improvement in terms of high school graduation rates. So given that, and given the work that that took to get here, what, how have we gotten ourselves in this current situation that we have so many more students who are making it through high school, but so few who are actually ready to take the next step and move on and get through college? So I think it's exciting to have this panel and to have this many people come out for this panel because we've been trying to make this the focus of our work for the last two years because we believe that while we've made really powerful strides, kids have a right in New York City when they leave our system to be equipped with that range of skills that David just talked about. And for those of you who are teachers in the city, um, you've worked with kids at every level from you know, kindergartners who come in and are so excited to share the fact that they learned to tie their shoe but can't necessarily speak English yet, to the middle school kids that are late every day in my sixth grade class when I used to teach because um, she had to drop off her kid. Um, her, little, her, her, her little brother and sister, um, because her mom was working, to high school kids that are coming out of um, situations where they've, you know, for whatever reason, only got one credit and they're 16 years old and are now trying to figure it out. And those kids all have a right to get to a point when they leave the system that they can succeed and act independently, either in a college environment or in a career environment. And that's our obligation is to provide that for our students. And where we are not providing it, we're failing them. And so as a department, we've set a goal for ourselves to make our students college and career ready and have begun to put systems in place, not just at the high school level, but from pre-K on up, to figure out what do we have to change and what we're doing from how teachers teach, the kinds of assignments that we're giving to our students, if we don't ask kids to do uh, rigorous thinking and tasks, they're not going to do it. If we don't ask kids to do a lot of writing, a lot of speaking and defending of their ideas, they're not going to do it. So we have to change our teaching practice, we have to change our curriculum practice, and we have to start to build the softer skills that David was talking about. So this year, for the first time in our quality review, we're asking reviewers to look at academic and personal behavior similar to the sort of skills of resilience and persistence and ability to ask for help um, that kids are displaying because we know that even with the academic strengths, a lot of kids are getting lost because they don't have those softer skills. So that sort of combination of work is generating tremendous energy and enthusiasm across the system and I think we have to be also clear-eyed about where we are. Uh, you know, the, the data nationally is about 25% of kids in four years are college ready, and that's about where we are in the city. When you look at the kids who are graduating, because some kids graduate in five or six years, about 37% are meeting that definition. And any way you cut that number, we're so far from where we need to be. And so, we need this conversation and we need the folks in this room and across the city to partner with us as we try and build towards this goal. So maybe I would ask Sheena, um, and this would go for everyone, but to begin with Sheena, are we then asking high schools to do too much? That is, can high schools, with all the situations that Shale just, de Shale just described, in terms of who's coming in, what they're dealing with, what they're bringing with them, <coughs> Can the high schools do all this? Can they overcome the impact of poverty, of racism, of all the different things that kids are coming in with? It sounds like the answer to that question is no. <laughs> well, I think you set me up there a little bit. But I mean, I think you know, one of the things that we fundamentally believe as a community a development organization is that high schools are not an island unto themselves. They are part of neighborhoods and part of communities. So no, they can't do it by themselves, but I think there are things and structures and systems we need to put in place to make sure that schools are better connected and integrated in community. Um, you know, I think that the system had been set up for some time with such a push and drive on uh, graduation rates and certain assessments <coughs> that high schools may, might have seen their role as college ready was just kind of getting you through the gate. 
getting you to the door, you know, you pass it a baton to somebody else, it's somebody else's problem. Um, just to get them graduated from high school. And as obviously we all very much appreciate, what we want for our own children is not just to get them across that high school graduation line or to get them to the door of college, but we want them to be lifelong learners and all the things that we all appreciate and all the values that we share. But the how is, is very challenging. I think you know, the things that Shell said certainly about how teachers teach and the other resources that schools absolutely need and there needs to be an investment and an adjustment, but there also needs to be that, those connections to community. Um, when you're talking about, you know, many, it was 30% of young people who's had a, a parent who had ever had any college. I mean, that has a significant impact on really <coughs> understanding what it takes to be prepared. So being very deliberate about um, parent engagement and making connections to the other resources in the community is something that I think has to be a priority for schools as well. Can I just follow on that real quickly? Sure. I mean, if you put it as a either or a dichotomous, then I think you know you miss sight of the fact that we can do this incrementally. Uh, we don't take every responsibility in the, into the schools, but we there are things that we we do have kids actually a fair amount of time if we look at it over the course of their lives. I mean, it's not a trivial amount of time, and students, young people are looking for direction. They are looking. Um, they want to know who they should be and who they should become. And we can signal that in a lot of ways. I mean, if you want to look at the number one predictor of, of um, juvenile delinquency behaviors, it's impulse control. I mean, it's not, I mean we correlate we, we these correlations with reading and writing scores, but impulse control is actually um, the, the behavioral dimension that correlates the most strongly. So, how, so something like goal setting, for example, um, just to stay with a simple example here, is a way to sort of think about impulse control. And establishing in young people's lives the notion of cause and effect, that I have some control over my life, that my behavior makes a difference, seems to me to be a very worthwhile thing to do, and it's not something that's beyond the capability of schools to do, and it doesn't cost us huge amounts of money and take whole new textbooks and, and extra, you know, we have a reducing class size, and, I mean, which would be a good thing to do, but I mean, it doesn't, re it's not a prerequisite of having environments that are, in which causality is built in students are taught to take control of their lives, taught to work on impulse control, and given tools and techniques is, is something as simple as goal setting. So that would be like an example of how we pick this off a little bit at a time, rather than viewing it as you know, a tsunami, it's so overwhelming, you know, we don't have control over everything in their lives, so, we can't, so we're powerless. You know, I, I've taught a lot, I've done a lot of um, professional development work, and the one thing that really distinguishes effective teachers from less effective teachers is self-efficacy. It's the sense that they have some control over their professional lives and their ability to have an effect on young people. The teachers who do not believe that, uh, I mean, they're not bad people, but they're not very effective. And it, you, you, we have to create schools in which the teachers believe that they can have some control over the, their, their, their success and their effect on students. And I, so I think it's not, if we set it as an either or, then I think we, we can uh, sort of breed a sense of, hel of, of uh, helplessness and, defeat and defeatism because we, we don't control every variable. But if we pick the variables off one at a time, I think we can make progress. Fernando, could you talk a little bit about your experience and also the young people that you work with in terms of what, does that ring a bell to you? Does that sound right? I and mean, what gets in students' way? Um, you said what gets in students' ways? Yeah, what gets in, what gets in students' ways, whether it's academic or not academic? Um, I think it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's, it's both. Um, for the students that we work with, it, it, like the, what they're learning isn't engaging. It doesn't connect to what, what they're going through day to day in their life. Um, and I think this is where like, we really need to get like, some other community organizations to come in and partner with schools to start talking about like, maybe the hist like, you know, in the history classes, talking about the history of the community um, and start connecting to like, what, what's actually happening around the students outside the walls of their school to what's happening inside the school. The other thing I think is uh, uh, for teachers, like teachers don't have much freedom or room to actually um, play with the curriculum and make it creative and try all these new things. Um, and if they do, they may not have the resources to do that. Right? They, may need, they may need equipment, they may need technology, they may need, may need supplies. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's all that. Okay. And um, Richard, could you come in on, in terms of what are you seeing in CUNY in terms of the students coming in? What are they coming in with and what are they coming in without? I think the, um, just to add a little bit to the classroom experience, I think the other piece that makes it very difficult to te for teachers and principals is the fact that they have a very wide range of behavioral issues in a single classroom 
uh, that oftentimes spend more time in discipline or trying to keep the, the group engaged as opposed to being able to teach or have the students learn. And I think that's also part of, of the equation in terms of the ability of what happens in the classroom and the, the amount of time that they have. With regard to what we see at the university side, I think um, because the environment, the, index, the expectations are much different, uh, where we do have all of the resources available for students, but rather than say, we think you need to do this, or here you need to make sure that you do this, we expect students to um, access that. Uh, and they often don't have the skills or the, even the know-how that this is how they, they get help if they need a tutor. This is how they go up to the faculty member. Um, they're, they're not used to, as I described to, to high school students when I meet with them, in high school you may be asked to read a uh, you know, three or five pages um, for the next day and you're reminded of when the, the test is going to be, what paper will be. Um, in college, as most of us um, experience, you get a syllabus, now you get an email or you sign into a portal account and everything that you're going to be doing for the next three and a half months is there. And very seldom will you have someone tell you this is what you need to do. So one of the things that we need to do, on, that we're doing on the college side, is really becoming a little bit more intrusive. Uh, because we do understand that the model that we had in place is not working for the students that are coming in. Uh, and this is not an impact just uh, for low performing or low income students. We're seeing this across the board for all students. Um, I think the other piece, um, the, uh, the other challenge that we have in New York in particular is the fact that we often assume that families know what the college search means. Um, in most, and that's a U.S. American phenomenon, it's not something that exists outside of the U.S. Most other countries, students um, are tracked from a very young age and a very small percentage of them have access to university systems. Um, the other, so we spend, I, my team spends a lot of time talking to students and families about what does it mean to go to college and that there is an opportunity to go to college for everyone. Um, and in many places, um, parents don't feel that they could connect because they may find it disrespectful to go to the school and ask for help because they assume that the school is going to do that. So that's another piece that we need to put together. Um, but we're looking at how do we try and bridge the gap because the model of just waiting for students to come and access the services um, is just not working well. Okay, so given that... Could I just should, add one yeah. thing that I think is really powerful CUNY has been doing is they've started some pilot programs where they ask kids um, who are going into the program in a community college level to have their whole schedule, sort of a full-time schedule over a chunk of time in the day, which is actually a big predictor of success, it turns out, because a lot of why kids don't make it through is that they're working and they might do part-time work or you know, don't have sort of a focused, sustained experience. And then another thing that I think that's, that's very powerful is this partnership that CUNY's built with us, which is trying to really understand what does this handoff have to look like? And how do we start with kids you know, much earlier to prepare them to make that transition and then put in supports um, as they're making that transition? And that's, that's a new thing. Gates funded us a couple years ago and it's actually generated some really powerful work. And to CUNY's credit, that 12% number that was cited for community colleges doesn't include all of the students who move to four-year colleges from the community colleges who are not graduates but are transferring into programs that do have an 80% graduation rate. So I think that there, there is some powerful stuff that, and focusing on this as a K to 16 challenge, this is about the you know, whole K-12 spectrum and the transition, but it's also about strengthening the actual practice at the university and community college level, which still needs a lot of work as well. Yeah, so and if I could just add, I'm sorry, since uh, thank you for the uh, endorsement. Uh, one program that was uh, funded by the city of New York uh, was the ASAP program, which we started four years ago. And uh, the goal, um, the dream at the time, was to get 1,000 students into our community colleges and have them graduate in three years with an associate's degree. As you heard, our graduation rate um, for overall students was um, or is around the teens, uh, fluctuates depending on the community college. Uh, what we did with ASAP was create a model 
as Shelley just described, where students are block scheduled, they're required to be full time, they are required to go to, so we, we have a very intrusive academic advising model. Um, and uh, we were able to, our goal was to have 50% graduate in three years. In three years, we had 55% graduate. So we did something in three years that I think most people thought we could never do. So what we're trying to do is now replicate that across all of our community colleges uh, because the student population that we serve is very different than it was 10 years ago. Uh, we are a traditional university, both at our community colleges and our four-year colleges, and uh, we want to focus not just on access, which has been kind of the, um, what we've thought about, okay, if they graduate from high school, we say, yes, congratulations, you've been admitted, that's, you know, we're done. We provided access, now it's up to the student um, to, to finish. We have decided that that is not acceptable, that we really need to match success uh, and outcomes with access because you can't have one without the other and that's part of all these different initiatives that we're working on to make sure that every student that comes into our system um, succeeds. We have an advantage over other university systems where all of our colleges are within a relatively small geographic area and we have an integrated system so students can start at a community college and be able to <coughs> transition into a four-year school. So that's an advantage and I think we're, we're trying to figure out how do we do that better and perhaps help other systems replicate that. Okay, so bringing it back to the public schools and, and Shale, um, if, this, if these sorts of skills are so important, um, we saw some of the statistics about the guidance counselor caseloads. Um, there's also a statistic that shows that 90% um, of students who actually are able to fill out the FAFSA form get to college and enroll, which is a, I mean, you would never think of that as a predictor, but that's a big deal. So is there any thought, I mean, should guidance be more mandated to the extent that the city mandated parent coordinators um, at some point because they wanted to make sure that there was more parent involvement, does the city need to do more in terms of bringing down the caseloads or mandating a separate college advisor per certain number of students because only 20% of guidance counselors' time is, is spent on college. Does the city need to step in and be more intrusive, as so Richard put it? What we started to do this past winter is training a couple of people, and it could be a guidance counselor, it could be someone else in the school who's taking a leadership role in this. So the, that data is incomplete in the sense that there are different folks playing these roles other than licensed guidance counselors in schools. But we want every school to have leadership um, at the guidance level or teacher level who have been trained in really effective college counseling techniques. And Goddard Riverside Options Program, which is recognized, I think, across the city as one of the strongest training programs for this type of work, is we're in the process of training folks from every high school that began last winter and will complete that cycle by um, this December and what they're being trained on is a bunch of the things in the sort of bottom right quadrant that David had, you know, those access types of issues. Um, for example, the FAFSA, I would estimate, and this is rough, that kids who are in our school system and go on to CUNY or SUNY during the course of um, you know, all of the cohorts that we've got right now in those institutions are probably leaving on the order of $50 million a year on the table in federal and state um, grants that they could be getting. And that happens because kids don't fill out the FAFSA forms when they're in high school, or they might do it in high school, but then after the first semester of college, they have to do it again, and if there aren't supports in place for them to do it, they often don't do it then. And actually training folks both at the college level and at the high school level on how do you walk families through this because it's hard. It's actually very similar to a tax form with lots of detail and particularly with our immigrant families who have questions about when they can safely report data um, if they're undocumented. That becomes a real hurdle um, to getting access to those resources and then you end up with young people who are working a job or two jobs while they're in college, don't have the resources that they need, don't have that focus, um, and then they don't make it. So part of what we're trying to do is get that knowledge and a set of very clear skills in each school around training for that and some of these other key areas. And I think as schools develop 
out these models, we're, we're trying to put pressure on them through a number of means by offering them these resources, but also saying to principals, your grade on your progress report is going to depend on how many kids actually enroll in college. And principals are not totally happy with us about that because they feel that I can get a kid into college, but then that period from May to September when they're supposed to go, all kinds of things outside of my control can happen. And what we've been saying is, yes, that's true, but if you lay this foundation well and you see this as part of your responsibility, a lot more kids are going to get there. And that's the purpose of that pressure. And so in combination, I think what you're going to see is much, much more attention. It's already happening across the system to these kinds of resources and supports. If I could just sure. piggyback on the last part of your comment, which is this making the transition. Um, we've got to stop thinking in terms of K-12 and then post-secondary, and we've got to think about it at the very least 11 to 14. I mean, the real difficult transition is between high school and college. And, we're, and yet, we're not even thinking about really connecting the systems up. One of the things we've been doing is going around the country doing workshops where we bring high school and college faculty together. And it starts by talking about students' um, work, like the writing, their expectations for students, and it quickly becomes a much broader conversation about exactly these types of issues, which is how can you have how can you get students successfully from high school to college? And it won't, it won't happen with um, people working in, in isolation. And in New York City, you're not. You're working together. But I would just encourage the more connections you can make. Because students don't go, you know, there's 4,200 institutions, give or take, in the US that grant, uh, you know, that have post-secondary programs. Students don't go to all 4,200. They go to a few. You take any given high school, and most of the kids, students go to a, a relatively limited number of post-secondary institutions. You know, you can find a few exceptions to that if you have schools that are um, more, um, that are magnets or that draw from a large population. But uh, for the most part, students will be going to schools in a, in a sort of a, a limited number, which means you can build stronger partnerships and relationships with those schools. So in an environment like this where you have control over the geography in, in some senses, for, and where a lot of students are going to go somewhere that's relatively local, you're taking advantage of that to make those connections and really build those bridges uh, through some reasonably straightforward programs uh, and then some outreach and workshop and communication between f and among faculty, I think, is, is a logical step that is, wouldn't overwhelm the system in terms of capacity and, and cost. Sheena, did you want to jump Yeah, I just wanted to just take a, a step further, um, you know, the great ideas in terms of how to make sure that the young people are getting the ad advice and the guidance that they need. And, you know, with the requirement and kind of the stick that, you know, schools you are going to be held accountable to in terms of how young people are persisting through college, there really does need to be a, a concomitant investment in the resource. Um, so I don't think training uh, is going to be sufficient in a kind of identifying a leader already existing in a school that already has five other jobs, but a real investment in someone who's at least one person who is, that's what they do. I mean, one of the charts, and I think, we, you know, we were one of the groups that participated in the study uh, for, with the new school for uh, college-ready communities. T only 20% of that person who's designated is actually doing guidance. They're, they're doing something else 80% of the time. And, you know, all the community-based organizations that were part of this effort went out and did fundraising. You know, we have a fully staffed, you know, college office by Robin Hood, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, 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 I mean, as was described, it's, there's a, it's enormous in terms of the level of guidance that's really needed. So if that is a priority, if it's really going to be a measure of our success, there's got to be an investment of resource that, you know, parallels how important that we're saying it is. Like it needs to be funded. Right, yeah. and, you know, so like you said, para coordinator, <laughs> there's got to be somebody who's, as opposed to one, you know, a, another layer. Yeah, yeah I mean, hold on just one let me second. Speak. I think Richard can, has been trying to jump okay. in here for a couple of minutes. Um, in addition to working at CUNY in my free time, um, I'm very involved with the New York State Association for College Admission Counseling, and I'm a, uh, sorry, and I am a, uh, retired member of the Board of Directors for the National Association for College Admission Counseling. Um, I think we have a, a huge problem with professionals in our school buildings who are trained to do college counseling. Um, guidance counseling to me is not college counseling. Um, it's more crisis intervention, discipline, scheduling, and there's not a single state in the union that requires a licensed professional who is expected to go to a high school 
to do college counseling to know anything about college counseling because it is not taught in any program. I think UB, the University of Buffalo, is the only program that has an elective that, require, that, that talks about admission. So if you have that professional coming into a school building who is going to spend 20% of their job doing college counseling, they probably will spend the first three years learning about the job because it's not something that they've ever, so we're making an effort with our affiliates across the country to go to graduate education programs and talk about the importance of college counseling. I think that it is um, unfair to expect the high schools to do it all. Uh, there's a lot that happens from nursery through sixth and eighth grade and I think we need to also look, at, look back and try and figure out what is happening in fifth grade English and mathematics. What is happening in seventh grade English and mathematics? Because those are going to be, those are the transition points that determine what high school a student goes to and what courses that student takes. Um, I think the other thing, the other resource that we've not tapped into is that in every single classroom that our students are in, there is a professional who's been to college and probably already has a master's degree. So how do we create that college going culture? Uh, because I think the process of applying is probably the easy part. It's really doing all the work that gets you to the point where you could say, yes, now I'm going to see this is what I have available. So I think we need to kind of continue to support um, our school system, but also we need the resources to make sure that we have that there. And I think the other piece that's missing is a relationship between that professional in the school with the faculty in the school in terms of you know, how do you get students to think about careers? How do you get students to get letters of recommendation? So there, there's, a, there's all these different links. It's not just about providing information to the student and his or her family, but there is another infrastructure that's already in place that we need to try and uh, take advantage of. Okay, I also have, sorry, Shell, um, Fernando was trying to jump in. And if you could, when we spoke before the panel, if you could talk a little bit about what you see in terms of this, and then if you're comfortable about what you saw at JFK, Sure. when you were there and what kind of happened. Um, so I just wanted to echo again that we do need the investment in someone who, whose job is just to do college advisement and then someone who's a, a guidance counselor. Um, and I wanted to speak to some alternatives that, that we actually play with and, and have um, at the Urban Youth Collaborative and, and the different organizations. Um, so we have like the Student Success Center model where there's actually one person whose job is to work with the students on college advisement. Um, that person also trains other young people in the building so that those young people make the language, you know, more accessible um, and run workshops with the other students. And this starts at the 10th grade. Uh, so this isn't something that students do in their senior year. Um, and these students who are running the workshops and getting trained may get like a community service credit or an elective credit, right? Because students have to do that anyway. This is an alternative because at some point we're going to hear there's not enough money to fund this one person or, or to fund several people to do this, right? Um, and the Leadership Institute High School, which is a school where we had a student success center where there was about 100 seniors by their senior year every Every senior had a college portfolio. What that meant is every student had some portfolio that said what credits they needed to graduate, what, what support they needed, what colleges were they interested in, what colleges did they visit, um, and they knew all the, they had all the information that they needed to apply for financial aid. So when time came, they were able to do that, right? So the, the, this is like an alternative that really works, right? Or another alternative is, is to train all the teachers, which it starts like is, is, is something that's starting, but to really train the teachers so that colleges is something that people are talking about or they're running small workshops in, in the homeroom or in, um, you know, uh, the break period that they get in, in the beginning of the day. I don't know what they call it anymore, but when I was in high school, they called it homeroom, right? And we kind of just sat around and took attendance. Um, and then we just spoke about what was happening in the school overall for the month, whether it was like a school event or whatever. But if they spend that time in the ninth grade talking about what college is and what the transition looks like, and you just do that, even though these are alternatives that work and that help, or at least in the schools that we're working in, like the Leadership Institute and the Frank and Killing campus um, and the Bushwick campus. Um, when I was in high school, I, I went to the John F. Kennedy High School when it was still its own high school. Um, and my freshman year, I had no, got, no counselor, period. Um, my program had no name where the college counselor was or the guidance counselor. Um, I had several lunch periods. Um, and, and I really mean that. I really had several lunch periods. And you entered um, as a straight A student. And I, I entered as a straight A student. Um, I had classes where there were no teachers. And of course, things were, were much worse back then. But there, there's, just to give you an idea of like what uh, 
students were, were facing, right? And we thought that uh, the small schools wave came at that time, and we thought that small schools were the answers. Um, and then real quick, we saw that that wasn't the answer because we, we thought just breaking down floors was creating new schools. Um, and this started to cause a whole new new set of issues. And I think now what we're doing, um, and our work is working with the, like we have to work with the entire campus. Um, so we actually have relationships with schools that we, we would never get into because of the kind of college readiness work that we do um, at SBU and, and the platform that we have uh, at the Urban Youth Collaborative. So we actually have uh, someone on our staff who goes into the school and, and creates these portfolios with students, uh, spends one day of the week at the school. I mean, we don't have all the capacity in the world to work with every school five days a week, uh, but we work with about five different campuses. And what that means is in each campus, there's about four to five other schools, um, to give you an idea. But it's because of the alternative model where this person goes in and works with other students to kind of run these trainings at, 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 you know, in the ninth, 10th grade, and it starts to create that, that college readiness culture or you know just having students think about college uh, you'd be surprised how many students you know don't know the difference between financial aid and a loan um, you'd be surprised how many students don't know that their grades matter in the ninth grade and the tenth grade or that they can visit a college um, before they get to their senior year so these are some of the things we're trying to teach students and, and it doesn't necessarily cost a lot for like an entire campus for four schools uh, to five schools it costs about 150,000 200,000 to run a student success center um, and I think for something with like, you know, this, the, these alternatives, something we need to really look into if we don't have the money to do it, which I'm pretty sure is, is the case. Yeah, I'm going to let you all come in. But the reason I thought that that story was so striking also about what you went through is that you come in as a straight A student and that wasn't even enough. So you get lost in JFK and have to go find another pathway to, to yeah. end up graduating from high school. So that to me is very intense because that's, you know, you're coming in, you're fully prepared academically, but something gets lost in the high school. But Shale, I know you wanted to. So yeah, I think the money question is sort of the first place to go. And so the answer, it's not something that we would have not looked at first if we had what would cost probably in the neighborhood of 600 to 700 million to create that kind of position. Last year, we were cut by the state and the feds $2 billion. And we, for the first time this year, don't have reductions in schools' budgets. After three years of successive reductions, at totaling like 15%. So it's a really difficult financial moment for the system to manage a massive investment when we're, when you talk to principals this year about their budgets. and. You say, well, it's flat, it's not so bad, right? And they say, well, actually, um, all of my teacher salaries went up this year because they're on a step plan, and so that puts me 150 or $200,000 in the hole, and if I had any enrollment challenges, that can shift it too. So this is a really difficult moment as we try and figure out how to balance resources. And so in that context, thinking about well, as we look around the city to schools that have mastered this and are figuring out how to do it, um, we actually can see places within the constraints of the existing budget that have really invested in getting not just a guidance counselor or a college counselor involved, but building it into the fabric of what teachers do in the school. So, you know, Brett Kimmel at Wheels actually has his humanities teachers work with kids as part of their curriculum um, to write their college essays to CUNY and SUNY. And then they have a march at the end of the year where they mail those essays together as a community event um, from the school to the post office in Washington Heights. Those kinds of sort of cultural rituals and making it at the heart of the school's curriculum don't actually cost money and are possible to leverage the resources, the sort of larger resources of the school towards the school. So money is always good, but there are also very real constraints that schools are facing and the system's facing. And so in the context of those constraints, how do we intelligently approach this and try to build it into the fabric of what schools are doing in ways that are powerful? Okay, I'm gonna just shift gears here a little bit because um, I thought something that David said was provocative, at least in the city, which is that not knowing content won't kill you if you know, and I'm gonna mess up the quote, but the structure or the, learn, the ability to learn, and you can correct me. 
but that's a. You just got to be clear. It's, it's not not, <laughs> not knowing. It's, it's not, not an either or. Can't get, you can't yes. get away with not knowing anything. You have to the know point stuff. Is there's, a, there's a floor beyond which there's totally. some variation. So go ahead. Right. Yes. No, I know you, <laughs> people need to know how to like write a sentence and um, add and stuff like that. So, um, but I guess this is sort of a question for for all of you. Um, is there actually a way to measure these skills that are not content? Focused. I mean, that one of the things I know, Shale, you were talking about is that one of the problems that we've had in the city is that if you pegged your performance just to the tests as they have existed, the state tests, you're not going to be ready because those are not rigorous enough. They're not crafted well enough. So you're creating a whole battery of new tests, hoping that that will hold, create some sort of accountability or at least measure where students are at. So can are those tests going to do that, or do we need other measurements? What? Yeah. I think both. So the the problem a teacher who understands what David shared with us this morning has right now is that they're making a very tough decision between meeting their kids' needs in a bigger sense and getting the kids good at taking the state exams. And that kind of schizophrenic experience is unacceptable because it should be that the signal that the state exams are sending are exactly the signals that teachers need to be responding to to get their kids to meet the demands that they're going to face when they leave school. And that is shifting. Like the state in partnership with us and other states around the country are actually changing in deep and fundamental ways the kinds of questions and assignments that are going to go on to those exams that make them much, much more aligned. And in the process, that has created a teachable moment in the system because schools have now been given permission and encouraged to actively think about how do we develop a different set of curriculum materials, how do we develop a different kind of assignment that's really going to push on these deeper skills. And that is unleashing powerful, exciting work in schools across the city. And teachers are, who haven't been doing this, and there are many schools that have invested in this for many years, but there are others that have never. For teachers who haven't been doing this, it means learning how to teach in a different way. And instead of doing a mile wide, inch deep type of curriculum, actually going deeper and pushing at the sort of kids' cognitive experience and really thinking about how do I both build in the softer skills around resilience as well as the thinking skills as I'm working with kids through this content. And if you have a more focused set of content as opposed to trying to do everything, and if you have a signal from the assessments and from the sort of resources that are out there around curriculum that it's good to go deep, it changes the classroom practice and creates some space, I think, to master this kinds of work. And it's not easy. Like, this is not something that you can just say from one day to the next, okay, go do this. This is actually a set of capacities you have to build over time. People have to get good at it. They have to make mistakes and they have to learn from those mistakes. And I think what's happening right now is exactly that in the system. And, and I would also say the good news also, I think, is that you we're not starting from scratch. I mean, there are curricula and assessments that do exist that measure those types of things. So we, and as part of the College Ready Communities Initiative and Collaborative, we actually started in middle school you know, um, just harping on what, what others have said, how you have to start earlier. And we actually have an international baccalaureate curriculum for the middle school years, and it's a school-wide effort and program that measures and assesses and teaches just the things, I think, that Dr. Connolly was talking about. So there are curricula, there are assessments, and it's a matter of how do we adapt and how do we really, you know, get them deeply rooted, those structures within schools, and, uh, you know, as Shell said, the teaching practice, I mean, what's happening in schools of education has to be adjusted to make sure that we're getting the outcomes that we need. And there needs to be a real big focus on that as well. Okay. Richard, do you want to? just wanted to um, also say that in New York City, we are, or we're in New York State, um, I think we're pretty way ahead of the game with regard to the relationship between CBOs, 
school systems and higher ed, um, it is a relationship that, thanks to the Department of Education, has kind of come together uh, rather than being three different silos and often only meeting on the college admission side. So I think that that's another resource that we have in the city uh, that, that I think will help us deal with the lack of resources, quote unquote, perhaps in a school building. Um, and I think it's just a matter of trying to keep those links. I think that the, the soft skills, as Shell has mentioned, is one that we also need to focus on. I think students don't have the persistence uh, to kind of say, okay, I failed, therefore, you know, let me try something different. I think most of the time it's, I failed, therefore, I'm not going to do this anymore. And uh, so, you know, talking about we have a lot of students who enter our college and make, make it through, quote unquote, the admission gate, uh, which in my institution is wide open. Um, but they don't, they, don't, they don't stay. So something, you know, it's not just about getting them to have that minimum or that quantitative piece, but it's really all the other pieces that somehow they've not been able to develop to navigate what's going to happen year one, year two, year three. Okay, and then, um, David, do you want to come in on that? Because what we're talking about is adding a, a test or a measurement of persistence, right? Well, let's, I mean, let's or something. Yeah, you... So first of all, my point was everything doesn't have to be high stakes. Um, that you can combine the information, and some of it is really useful just for the student to know themselves. Some of it is useful for institution to know about their entering class. Like for, if, if, if CUNY really had a much better sense of what student skills were along a series of different dimensions, not just the content knowledge, but the study skills, the time management, uh, the goal settings, what, they could target the resources. And they could also tell the student, just give them a nice little, you know, congratulations, you know, you're based upon this information, we, want it, we think these resources are really important for you to connect with. Here's the links to them. You know, it's still your responsibility to do it, but we're, we're now, we're, we're giving you a more, more of a profile uh, link to some information about who you are and not just generically saying you need to get better at X, Y, and Z. So we collect a lot of information in schools right now, but we tend to collect the same information over and over again. Um, so if we're a math instructor, we may have uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 different homework assignments where we collect little tiny bits of information. Well, I mean, partly we're collecting information on how, how you did on that test, on that assignment, but we're also collecting information on how you manage your time. We're just throwing that away. Um, we're, we're not, we're not, we, we may uh, give you a test and you don't do well on the test and we tell you that you have the opportunity to retake the test. Well, if you retake it, that's a, not only is that an academic measure, that's a persistence measure, you know, I mean, so, we, but we're throwing that information away. <clears throat> um, we may, uh, as a teacher, we, it may be possible to observe a student who uh, really struggled with a piece of writing but stayed with it, even though the quality of the work wasn't that fantastic in the end. Um, they put more effort into it. There's no acknowledgement for the student. We've thrown that information away. So, I mean, there's ways we can collect information that doesn't always involve the state coming up with a test. Uh, in other countries around the world, in fact, uh, and, and other, other professional areas or, or, or employment-related areas, this type of information is actually more important than the academic information for predicting success in a variety of different venues outside of school. So it's not an either or from my point of view, but it is to say that collecting this type of information can be done in um, low stakes ways where we don't need high technical um, adequacy for the information, at least not, certainly not initially, but it signals what's important to the student and the teacher, and I think that was Jill's point also, is you, you want to signal what's important to students and teachers, and I think that's where we start. And the profiles that we build are designed to support your success, not to point out what's wrong with you. And I think a lot of times what's happening now with our testing data is we're telling students about their deficiencies and focusing all of our efforts on fixing the deficiency without you know, concomitant information about what they do well and strengths that they can continue to build on. Now, most of us in our lives don't get up in the morning and say, what don't I do well that I can do better today? I mean, a few of us are neurotic enough to do that, but you know, most of us, <laughs> most of us say, you know, I'm gonna enjoy being a competent adult and I'm gonna play to my strengths. And we have strategies for dealing with some of our weaknesses. Well, when young people are in school, we, wanna, we don't wanna you know, ignore the weaknesses at all. We wanna provide them targeted support to help them improve them. But we also want them to, we want to help them understand what their strengths are. You know, if we're going to get more kids to college, we've got to focus on what they can do as well as what they can't do. And figuring out what they do well will enable them to have a better idea of what futures are open to them. And if there's a mismatch, this is what I was saying, if there's a mismatch between their aspirations and their skills, that's the information they really need is to say, what's that mismatch and what do I need to do to resolve that, that mismatch? Then you've got an action potential, right? You've got a discrepancy between what is and what ought to be. 
know, when you talk about what motivates kids, part of it's having relevant, engaging information, but part of it is having some discrepancy between what, where they are and where they want to be. And we don't get that to them very well. We just say, do well, study harder, take the test. But there's not, it's not a gap between who I am, where I am, and where I want to be. Okay, I'm going to open it up for discussion, questions from the audience. There are two folks who are going to be going around with microphones, so just stick your hand in the air and they will get you. While you're thinking, though, I'm going to throw one more question, um, maybe starting with Sheena, but um, anyone's welcome to answer, which is the role of nonprofits in this whole, um, in the whole process of getting kids ready for college. Um, it seems like, from an outsider's view, it looks crucial in terms of the programs that have been successful really have partnerships with nonprofits. And if you could speak to that and also some of what you were talking about, about creating a community versus the sort of theory of competition between schools. Um, that was interesting. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, um, the chart that uh, the part of the New Schools report that showed you know, in white what the nonprofit providers were providing and in blue what uh, the actual schools were able to provide shows the kind of critical role that uh, other community-based organizations in the community plays in helping to fill the gap and, and bridge, you know, she was talking about we need to be more creative and more resourceful and really tapping into the resources and the importance of the philanthropic community in terms of making an investment and the corporate community in terms of making an investment because it's in our collective best interest that our young people are adequately prepared for life. Um, so, you know, kind of making those intersections. And I think the DOE has been um, particularly strong in this with the fund for New York City schools and certainly the relationships that it has with an array of nonprofits to help you know, pilot things and innovate and, and test models that are then scaled. And so that is, I think, a critical part. That's always going to be a critical part. Uh, I think one of the things that you alluded to, uh, Meredith, when we spoke um, before this, this concept of, um, you know, as a community development corporation, we're very focused on the entire neighborhood and the entire community. You know, we have programs from pre-K, through seniors, uh, so we touch people at every edge, edge of the spectrum, and we appreciate when our students graduate from high school, they're, they're still our constituents. You know, they're gonna come to us for housing and other things. So we, we really are focused on the overall well-being of the community, and I think that the way that the current system, from the federal government, um, city, et cetera, is very focused on your success is dependent often on doing better than your peers. You know, the whole, the whole language that there's a race to the top means that there are losers and you wanna be a winner. So you better get your stuff together and run as hard as you can to get the prize. Um, that is difficult and unfortunate if you're trying to look at a whole community and you want the, the whole uh, bar to be risen in a community as, as schools are measured, uh, your grade is dependent on how you do within your peer group. I think it's created this concept of, I don't want to share what's going well in my building and my best practices because I've got to stay two steps ahead of everybody else. I've got to compete. I've got to be better. And I think that that's been very challenging for us on the ground in neighborhoods where we have a very high performing school, a block away from a persistently low achieving school, and there is not a sharing of resources or even information to help you know, all the schools succeed. So in our work, uh, we have a very high performing school and we became an organization that takes over persistently low achieving schools so that we can spread that knowledge and resource because our goal is that every school in Harlem is a good school. Some are gonna be better than others, that's okay. Some are gonna be STEM, some are gonna be art, depending on what the child's needs are, but there should be a bar of excellence. And it's just been extremely difficult to break down the walls with some of the school leaders and school communities and say, you're doing some great stuff here. How can we spread it to the school down the street? Well, that's one of the schools I'm compared against. I don't, I don't want them to have what I have. And to, to, so we've gotta create, so one of the things that we were thinking is if, you know, kind of what gets measured gets done and this whole uh, sense of assessment and trying to push people in the right direction, now we wanna assess how students are doing as they get through college. That's gonna help you know, align behaviors to, to get there. 
one of the suggestions might be your grade is based on how the schools in your uh, community do in the district or the peer group. So it's not just you know, which you have been able to muster and to cobble together to have a level of success, but there's a responsibility to share that. So if you're doing, in, a, in one building, right, you have schools that are doing well and then the school that's persistently low achieving in the same building and you can see the stark differences. So we, we have to figure out ways to really create communities uh, of success and that's the goal for that the overall community is successful and I think that's also a big priority. Um, there questions? Hi, my name is Jeremy Del Rio. I'm both the parent of public school students as well as the director of a nonprofit called 2020 Vision for Schools, which works with public schools throughout the city. Um, and my question responds to much of what Dr. Connolly has presented. It seems to me that you're recommending a fundamental culture shift. When you talk about uh, cognitive strategies, when you talk about owning the learning of, for students, that they would have the ownership of their own learning, um, that feels like a very different approach culturally than the one that's built into the Department of Education system, right, where we treat students as consumers of a product. We don't treat them as owners. Even the language of soft skills as you've described readiness, resilience is not a soft skill, it's a foundational skill. I don't want my home built on a soft foundation. I want my home built on a hard foundation, a firm one, or else it's going to collapse. Um, and yet, whenever we have an education reform discussion at the school level, the classroom level, or the systemic level, the owners that you're describing are absent from the conversation. They're neither in this room, nor are they in Tweed, nor are they at the school level when the debate's happening if the school should shut down. So for instance, one of the schools in Brooklyn that we work with, and I'm not gonna say which one, as the superintendent was conducting the evaluation as to whether it should be closed, when given an opportunity to meet with students who are the most vested stakeholder in the decision, her response was, I don't need to hear from students. She wanted to hear from teachers, administrators, parents, but the students were largely irrelevant. And your scheme that advocates students owning their learning, what are some ways that New York City can make the culture shift when things like resilience are no longer soft skills, but they're foundational skills, and when the students who are the most vested stakeholder are given a voice to speak to these kind of issues? Well, there's a lot to that question. I'll just hit on a couple of them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if you're familiar with a researcher at Stanford named Carol Dweck, one of the, she has a program that teaches students about a, a, um, um, aptitude versus um, effort. And I, talk, I mentioned that earlier. And she teaches students that, um, if they, that it really does make a difference how hard you try at something. So, an example, a, a very simple example of empowering students is teaching them the difference between aptitude and effort, and having them understand that a test score is not, a, is not their destiny. So part of empowering students is having them become efficacious, having them have some control over their own environment, but also some responsibility. And clearly that has to evolve, and it has to be, you know, it has to be on a progression as they go through school. But we should be looking for every opportunity we can to invest students with ownership and with opportunity to make meaningful decisions about their lives. Um, but give them a framework within which they can't make bad decisions. And I think that's the balance. Uh, right now, students can make some very bad decisions in the, uh, the, the multiple lunch examples. When I was in high school, I was a very effective library assistant. Um, I was also, uh, you know, I was at a lunch monitor. I mean, I had one of those, my senior year in high school, I had one of those dream schedules. But um, we, we can't let students make those kinds of bad decisions. So, the adults have a responsibility, I think, as far as creating an environment in which everything a, a child does is going to help them succeed. The child then has to have some room to, take, to make some decisions and take some ownership. In, in a lot of ways, we treat um, our seniors, our 18-year-olds, in the same way that we treat our sixth graders. We don't give them the opportunity to make decisions, and then three months later, they're on their own in um, a CUNY environment, and they look at the syllabus, and they see that the first assignment isn't due for six weeks, and so what do they assume? You know, they've got five and a half weeks off, you know. So that's how they get 
in trouble. Now, the governance issue, I think, is a lot more complex. I actually did work early in my career at an alternative school that had a governing board made up of parents, students, um, and staff collectively. So I know this can work, and I mean, I think there's, there are meaningful ways we can engage students more actively in student governance, because what we've got to do is take, we actually have to kind of take control of the culture of schools. You know, in it, you got to remember, students are the ones who dictate the culture of schools because they outnumber the adults so dramatically. And we live in an era of youth culture. It's, I mean, even the teachers dress like students in a lot of places. I mean, there are some really powerful co-opting messages that have occurred here that the teacher, you know, that the students are running the, the place from a cultural point of view. And I, I don't think that students are always comfortable being in an environment where they're looking for guidance, they're looking to understand what, it, what they should be doing and how they should be behaving and they're not getting it. So I'm not arguing, you know, for, you know, the 1940s or anything like that, but I do think that we can, when we set environments that say what's important and what should be valued, that college going, uh, you know, when we studied 38 schools around the country, we found they all controlled the culture. 38 high schools that did a good job or better than expected job of getting kids to go on to college, they all controlled the culture very consciously and very deliberately in symbolic ways and then right down through a whole series of different um, mechanisms that we've talked about here, like um, a lot more, the expectation that every kid from the freshman year set up an online kind of a portfolio and then work with it for four years. The expectation that their schedule had to be in place in ninth grade and had to be the right, you know, it got reviewed once and you couldn't change it, you know, and, and get into trouble on a whim. And there's, so there's a lot of mechanisms where the adults and the students have to work collaboratively. But I do think that none of what we're talking about here works without students being um, owners of the, of the learning and making decisions about their own futures um, and having the information they need to make those decisions. Can I add just one more? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's happening this week in many of our high schools, and there are more and more each year that do this, is uh, roundtable presentations where students present portfolios of their work to um, community leaders, parents, teachers from the school, other students. And what's powerful about that is that as students start to be part of those panels and understand the rubrics that are being used to evaluate themselves and their peers, they start to get deep insights into what it means to be successful and own the sort of both the learning process and the assessment process in a different way. And if folks haven't seen that kind of work, um, it's burgeoning across the city, not just in schools, but also in some of our nonprofit partners that work with our schools. And I think it's a powerful way um, to get at this exact issue of, of kids having a deep sense of what it means when we talk about these, these sort of different types of skills and what it means to actually be good at these different types of skills. Can I ask you one thing about that? Because some of the schools, I, I went to one of those and it was incredible. Some of the schools that do that are actually the schools that are um, not within the DOE accountability measures. That is that they don't have to do all the things the rest of the schools do. So if you see that as something to reproduce and emulate, how, how, do, you, how do you square that? Well, actually, they are all of the consortium. I think you're talking about the consortium for performance assessment, which has a waiver from um, the state board of regents for some of the regents' exams. They only um, graduate students through portfolio, plus they have to take the English regents' exam. Mm -hmm. But all of those schools get progress reports, and the portfolios count on the progress report. And some of the highest scoring schools, actually, in the city on the progress report are amongst those schools. And so what we're trying to do on a formative basis at this point is create more experiences like that that aren't in the high stakes realm. But we've also been supportive of the consortium and given them resources to try and expand the number of schools that they're working with because we'd like to see more schools included in that. Okay. Hi. My name is Liz Kahn. I'm the director of one of the student success centers that was mentioned. Um, I actually have a question about the kind of low cost program that you mentioned at Wheels where in their classrooms they write a college essay and they walk their essay to the mailbox. Um, and so I work on a campus where our schools have a tremendous amount of resources through our program and that seems really lofty for our schools. And so there's a lot of reasons I see on the ground why somebody doesn't do that in humanities class when you have nine juniors passing in English regions. 
you know, principals have different training, things like that. So what do you think needs to happen from the DOE to make things like writing a college essay in an English class standard, where principals see taking an hour out of your day to walk things to the mailbox to symbolize the significance of the transition to college, a good reason to take an hour out of an academic class? Because I think that a lot of times when you're in a school, those two things seem completely ridiculous when you have a lot of other priorities happening or you don't have the training for the teacher or the vision of the principal to support those kinds of things. So because I thought that was such a good idea, um, two weeks ago we had our annual principals conference with over 1,200 principals and APs and other folks who support schools and I asked Brett and two of his students to come and speak to the whole group and describe exactly how they had built this into their school and what it was like as a student. He had a ninth grader and a 12th grader both speak. One of the most powerful things he said um, was that for the ninth and 10th graders, watching that march and seeing it as something to aspire to um, created such a sense of motivation. And so you're right that this is not something that you can just implant from one place to another. The first step is to promote good ideas that are working and then help teach people how to integrate those ideas. And I think that what's exciting about what's happening with the system's very intense focus on college readiness is he's not the only one who's come up with good solutions to this question. And as we get more and more of these, we are trying to disseminate them. The thing that I've learned about changing schools is that part of what makes a powerful change agent, someone like Brett who um, is able to build a school that can do that, is you have to have lived within a successful school organization and learn some of those things in order to take it somewhere else and build it. And so the more schools that are doing this work and teachers coming up through those schools are taking on those experiences and becoming leaders in their schools and ultimately leaders in other schools is a sort of long-term process for building capacity. The shorter-term process is trying to document good practices. You'll see that on our website. It's something that people can learn about how they did it, as well as putting people through the kind of training experiences that I was describing earlier. Can you, I just sorry. wanted to, again, probably an unpopular comment, but I'm gonna make it anyway. Um, why must that happen during the school classroom experience? That should be part of what's instituted in a culture in a building where, you know, I think we need to extend the school day, and, and I think one of the challenges that many principals face is that they have to contend with, well, you know, X person works from 7.42 till 2.59. So I think that we just also need to start thinking about, well, that's not enough time in the day to get all the things that we need to get done. And I think the challenge then is, well, if we do that, then something else is gonna be sacrificed. Where I think we are seeing, and from my experience, um, most, most professionals that I deal with who deal in the college counseling, um, they get most of their emails and their calls to us after 4 p.m. So I know that they're not working in that. But I think that we need to also start thinking about how do we build that into the culture of the building, not just within the constraints of, you know, contractual start time and, and end time. And that's a challenge that we're also facing um, at the university level that we're trying to deal with. And just, uh, just to pull back in terms of what Shale was just saying, um, given what Sheena was saying about competition and the role that that plays in terms of best practices, and the extent to which there is a good deal of competition built into the accountability system. How do you, how do you see the role of competition and its pluses and minuses? Yeah, I think it's a good point. And it's something that we've worked a lot on with our principals to try and help them understand that actually there's very little to be gained, um, even though they're in a peer group with 40 other schools by not sharing information with another school in that group. Because really what's happening is you're being compared to the average of how those schools did over a three-year period prior to the year you're talking about. So it doesn't actually matter that much if you think it's a good idea to compete. It's not gonna actually help you. People don't necessarily understand that, and it's something that we, each year, when we drew the training on the progress report, try to explain again. But truthfully, where we see powerful collaborations emerge is in small networks of schools that are working together around this instructional work. And we've tried to create space over the past couple years when we bring principals together in their network meetings to actually begin to talk about student work for the first time. Instead of having administrative meetings or 
meetings about sort of DOE initiatives, actually bringing to the table examples of kids' work with the rubrics and talking about the question of how good is good enough and how did you get here and what did you do in your curriculum and how did you support your teachers and that kind of learning community as it develops amongst principals has proven to be a powerful place and it's not at the point where I want to see it. I think that there's much more work to be done. It's uneven, but that's the goal. Yes, hi. Um, David Bloomfield from Brooklyn College. I want to go back to the college guidance issue. Uh, we have a situation in New York, uh, and I, I, it's a purported lack of resources, but uh, my two kids, one went to a competitive high school, one went to a screened high school, uh, high, uh, relatively high parent wealth in both schools, and both had parent-funded college guidance counselors. So we have a situation in New York where the rich get richer, and the rest are in uh, Andrew's first chart, are not guided in the way they should from ninth grade on. So Shale, I wonder how you're going to redistribute resources so that the high wealth schools uh, don't get all the guidance counselors uh, for a college and the rest are left to uh, kind of shift for themselves. Well, the fundraising that we do centrally is focused on the high need communities that don't have that access to parent resources. And so what Sheena was talking about earlier has been a big priority for us. And as you know, the high need schools that are higher poverty through the funding formula get more money than schools and middle class communities that have lower poverty levels. And that's needed, not just for college counselors, but for more teachers and other types of supports. But you know, the, the resource question is th there are elements of it that we can directly influence and we have tried to do that through creating a funding formula that's based on need, not standardized across um, the per capita, and by doing external fundraising where we can. But there's never, there's never gonna be the ideal amount of resources. And so the question is, with the resources that we've got, some of the strongest schools that are doing this work are in very high poverty communities and are doing powerful work around it. And that is the work that we're engaged in is to, tr that's, that's the mission here. We just named, um, are, are about to name this week, 40 schools that are getting a grant from Soros Foundation um, as part of the Young Men's Initiative called the Expanded Success in Initiative. And what that is, is identifying schools in high poverty communities around the city that enroll high numbers of black and Latino boys who are doing some strong work academically up to the graduation level, but are not getting kids to this college readiness level. And using this private funding that we got from a gift from Soros, how do we start to build a set of very deep models in those schools to get a different set of outcomes that we can then scale across the system? Uh, hi, I'm Sue Dietrich. I've been a parent leader for many years with the uh, parents associations. And I wonder how we can use parents to help in this effort. Um, at my son's school, um, our parent association actually brought in an outside group and we, we used it as a fundraiser and let the children take a test to see whether the ACT or SAT was better for them. Um, you know, and I learned my other two kids never took the ACT and I learned my son would do better on the ACT. Um, we also used the funding we raised from that to send our guidance counselor to um, professional development. Um, you know, in the scheme of things, we're not a high need school, but we also don't have a lot of money, but we were able to do that. And parent coordinators have, are not required now in high schools, which I think is a mistake. So um, what can we do to support parents to help in this effort? I'll say one new thing that we've been trying to figure out is how do we give parents more information about what their kids know and are able to do. So this year at parent conferences, we ask teachers to actually share more of this type of rigorous work that they're engaging the kids in with parents so the parents start to see it and actually have some of the context to support their kids as the kids are going through this process. And we're also building a tool that would allow parents to actually, a lot of schools have this, but a lot of schools can't afford it, to have access to the teacher's grade book, essentially, like to see the kinds of assignments 
that the kids are doing or not doing and, and how they're doing on a range of skills that teachers are um, trying to support kids with. I don't know if you have other. Okay, we're actually at time. Um, I'm really sorry, there's like a million other questions. We didn't even get into academic rigor or any of the million other things, but I wanted to thank the panelists for their time, for coming, for their candor. And um, if, you have, if you have any input or any thoughts, please give it in. It's part of why the report isn't finished yet, partially. Um, uh, and if you, if you put your name down, we will send you a copy of the report when it's done. So thanks so much for coming.